Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals. Welcome everyone. We're thrilled to have with us for this Q&A, Andre Gaines, the director of the one and only Dick Gregory, producer Valerie Edwards, and special guest, Christian Gregory. Our moderator for this conversation is MSNBC correspondent, Tremaine Lee. Pulitzer Prize and Emmy Award-winning journalist, Tremaine Lee, is a correspondent for MSNBC and host of the podcast, Into America. He covers social justice issues and the role of race, violence, politics, and law enforcement in America. In 2020, Tremaine launched The Race Report, a special MSNBC series that explores the intersection between race and politics. Tremaine was also among the contributors to, contributors to the New York Times Magazine's 1619 project. And previously, he served as a reporter at the Huffington Post, where he is credited with helping elevate the shooting of Trayvon Martin to a national audience. Jermaine, thank you so much for moderating today and please take it away. Thank you so very much, uh, AFI. Uh, really appreciate it. It's always an honor. Um, and this, this film was, was remarkable. It really was. And I have to admit one thing. When I was a kid, my mother went to the Bahamas with a good friend of hers, ran into Dick Gregory at the airport, took a picture and that picture had been sitting on my living in my living room for much of my childhood. So every day I would see my mother and Dick Gregory <laughs> sitting on the shelf. So this, this honestly was a treat. Um, you know, I was touched, I was moved, um, I smiled, I got angry. But Christian, I wanna start with you, man. Seeing your father's work captured, life and work captured in this way, what did you feel? Um, Tremaine, first, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, and also thank you, AFI, and to the rest of the team here. Uh, great question. I mean, it just is, um, as you, I'm, I'm one of 10 Gregory children, so, um, I don't think they had enough windows for all of us to join today. So I'll speak for the team. The, um, uh, it's just, it's exhilarating. I mean, very few folks have the opportunity to, I mean, this is six years in the making. I say there's 10 Gregory children. There's really 11 and 12 when you add Andre and Valerie. At this point, they're part of the family. Um, it just was such a deep dive. And uh, other than just being Dick Gregory's son, I also was my dad's caretaker, business partner, um, I thought, you know, I thought my mom and I were pretty much the only two true Dick Gregory whispers that knew everything. And I learned a tremendous amount from this film. Um, there's just so many different twists and turns. Sure, it's 110 minutes, but you're going to feel like it's a week coming at you in that 110 minutes a, a, a year because it's just a blitzkrieg of just uh, nonstop adrenaline, which is how if you ever had a 10 minute conversation with Dick Gregory, it felt like hours. So the film carries on um, with that energy. Um, and just you open it and mention your mom meeting my dad in the Bahamas. That was our home away from home, hence the Bahamian diet. So um, I hear stories like that. I mean, my dad was just, he was omnipresent um, and it never ceases to amaze me, the interactions. And uh, and I guess you're part of the family now too, if you grew up with a photo <laughs> on your fridge in the house. So uh, this family keeps growing for me. So thank I'm, I'm you. 13, proudly number 13. Proudly. <laughs> Um, Andre, you know, I want to ask you this. Uh, Dick Gregory was so many things. Um, he was an activist, a comedian, uh, a civil rights and anti-war activist, a health advocate. How did you approach the sheer enormity of, of who Dick Gregory was? How did you approach it as a, as a, as a tactician? How did you do it? I mean, that's why it took six years. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we, you, you really couldn't keep up with, with Dick Gregory. I mean, that's, that's the thing. We flew him out to Los Angeles and 2015 it was that was the first time we sat down with him and and I didn't know Dick Gregory or the family or anybody prior to that I just was really enthralled with uh, a performance that he did on something that used to be called the state of the black union uh, that was hosted every year you know it was like a summit at the beginning of the year and sort of black community could get together had this panelist of all these brilliant minds and thinkers and professors and Congress people, et cetera. And so once I um, got into the story of Dick Gregory and did the deep dive, I didn't realize how deep the, the dive really went. And so there was a version of this film that we kind of came into this story with uh, and, uh, or, or, or a story that we came into this film with, I should say, and then once we kind of lifted up the hood, it was like, wow, this thing 
there's a lot more here. And really at some point in the process, just had to decide to say, okay, well, this is the the extent that we can tell this story in a in a in a single film, just because there's so much. And uh, Christian can attest to this as he's an executive producer of the film, and we were working closely with uh, one of Dick Gregory's uh, biographers, a guy named Professor Ed Schmidt, and it just was countless, you know, material like one thing after the next. As you think that you sort of figured out. Uh, crack the nugget on 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 or crack the code on one story and then you get another piece of it it's like another jet magazine article or another time magazine article or another video or this that or the other and the story you told there's so many of those stories we encountered there's a lot of people with dick gregory pictures on their mantle with their mom or their grandmother or their father or Dick Gregory helped them move into a neighborhood that they were the first family to integrate it or Dick Gregory was marching with, you know, this group or this, uh, you know, Native American tribe or this women's group. It was just, this man was everywhere. I mean, he was absolutely everywhere. And it was one of those things that was really astounding because when can you ever talk about any historical figure that was part of every major American event basically since 1959 until he died. That's an extraordinary set of circumstances for one life to have. And so it was an honor for us to be able to tell the story, but it was hard. It was definitely difficult to try to fit all of that in there. And there was some things that we couldn't at the end of the day. So what's your, your favorite piece of archival material footage? What's your favorite thing that you've uncovered in this process? You're going to ask me that question. <laughs> you make me choose something. They're, they're like the uh, Gregory's kids. There's so many of them. You're like, I can't choose. They're all, oh, all yeah. I mean, um, I would say the, I would say the um, Dick Gregory's business partner, a guy named John Bellamy, who helped him, uh, build Dick Gregory Enterprises, which was his health and wellness <clears throat> company that um, spearheaded the Bahamian diet and the, the resorts down in the Bahamas. We found out kind of later in the process that Dick Gregory was an ath like a, a, a profound athlete, a star runner. And I used to run myself. And so we connected with each other on that. And then we found out that he ran across the country. And this was not something, this was not common knowledge. This was not something that we knew. It's not even something that we thought to know. And once we found that out, we were like, you know, do you have uh, any footage of this? And, and John was like, you know, I had this storage unit with all this footage and it got robbed and it's like gone. And I don't think I have anything else. And so, we were saying, all right, we're gonna to have to rebuild this somehow to tell this part of the story. And right when we were getting ready to do that, John reached out and said, I found something. <laughs> I, found, I found a little bit of this footage. I was like, I've only got about 20 minutes of it. And I shot, you know, days of it. I mean, hours and hours. And he's like, I only got about 20 minutes of it. And he sent it to us and it was exactly what we needed. It was, it was more than what we needed actually. And so, it's probably my favorite footage of everything that we were able to get together because we didn't think that we were going to be able to get it. But if I have to be honest, I think everything that we got uh, from what the family provided, childhood videos to, you know, Dick Gregory's marches down with, you know, in Greenwood, Mississippi and Medgar Evers, just everything that we were able to dig up is, uh, you know, something that lent itself to the, the, the sum of the parts um, at the end of the day. Valerie, so much of, of this documentary was in Mr. Gregory's voice, right? And I love every every generation of the voice, the early smooth, you know, the, the activist, cantankerous later on in life, like I'm a grown man, I've been around, I've seen some things, I'm gonna say what I wanna say. Um, I love it all, but how important was it um, that his voice carried through? Because in some ways, sometimes documentaries, you don't necessarily have to go that route. It could be a reflection, right? But how important was it to hear his own voice? Um, that was that was really important. Uh, when we started the project, Andre and I, um, you know, we had difficulty finding uh, an like an emotional inroad into the story, and we knew that 
you know, in order for it to connect with the audience, in order for them to feel anything, they would need to hear from Dick Gregory himself. So when we came across um, these infamous tapes, there were, there were these tapes with hundreds of hours of um, audio from Dick Gregory himself telling his story, it was really a game changer at that point. Um, I think, you know, it was midway in the process. And so it was going to be an expensive game changer. But uh, I think at that point, that's when Andre and I felt like, okay, we can really tell this story. Mm -hmm. Like, this is really, you know, there's really a chance this is going to be a movie. Because um, now we have the opportunity to not only uh, establish his vulnerability, but to um, tell this story with, you know, dignity, the type of dignity that he did not receive in his lifetime. And so that was really important to us. I mean, to, just to jump on that, I'm sorry, like one of the, you're sort of asking about technique and one of the things that uh, I mentor a lot of first time filmmakers. I mean, even my series on HBO earlier this year, The Lady in the Dale, that was from a first time filmmaker. And this is what Valerie is saying is like a perfect example where not only were we midway through the process, I mean, Christian knows this well, uh, too, we had a film. We, we had a movie that, that we had completed, that we were done. And upon discovery of these tapes in which Dick Gregory is speaking in, you know, his own voice uh, uh, in a hotel room in 1963 and other subsequent interviews that we use, we stopped and we said, we got to we got to start over. We got to redo this movie. Wow. We're, we want to make the best movie possible. And it's really, I think, a testament to kind of the fun part of filmmaking, but also the challenge that's that like people see the movie and it's just kind of like, oh, this was how it is, how it was mm -hmm. always from the beginning. You know, this is the idea you had all along. But the reality is that it's an evolution. It's a process. And in this case, we wanted to make the best movie. We knew there was a better movie lying in, in those tapes than the one that we had. And so we, we ended up starting over and, and doing it again. Val, you said this came midway in these tapes and the, the journalist yeah. in me needs to know like where these tapes come from, who was it? A, <laughs> what, what happened? A deep throat said, hey, I got something for you. What happened? Yeah. Right. I mean, if we tell you, we have to kill you. But uh, <laughs> no, we discovered the tapes from, um, uh, interview they were interviews they were part of interviews that a, um, another filmmaker um, who had attempted to make the film basically had in his dungeon and so yeah when we got a hold of them we didn't even listen to them at first because we knew what that meant we knew that mm. we needed to start over in, in denial <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it was, and it was like I'm not doing this I'm not you know we're it's 2018 2019 I think yeah and like, um yeah, and then the editor that we had at that time, you know, he started listening to it and he was like, you guys, like, this is Dick Gregory's, like, heart and soul, mm -hmm. you know, like, you have to listen to this. And it was probably like, I mean, one little snippet and it was like, oh, God, we have to jump into this. You know, yeah. we have to use this. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, it was a great find, but it was also a really um, scary it's Fine. challenging, yeah. So, so Christian, um, obviously you're, you know, the son of, of Mr. Gregory, but also as a producer on this film. And I wonder, is there anything that you learned during the process of this film coming together? I learned a ton. And uh, first, I want to say the this is going to sound odd, the joy that it brings me to hear the difficulty and the struggle that Andre <laughs> and Valerie went through, because the audacity to make a Dick Gregory documentary, it should have been a hazing. My dad would have had it no other way. Uh, you know, he was an intellectual hazer. Muhammad Ali complained about how he hazed them when they would go running together and Ali couldn't keep up. I mean, he was a tough love man. That's how he raised all 10 of us Gregories. Uh, so, and we realized that, you know, pressure and heat makes steel um, and that sustained pressure just really makes us stronger. Society doesn't give us anything. We have to earn it. Um, all of us were required to go to historically black colleges and universities. Most of us have advanced degrees, not to say, hey, I got it, but to apply those skills, those life lessons. You know, we were Dick Gregory's research and development team. I mean, we were health nuts uh, in the 70s. We were laughed at. And now in 2021, there's you know gourmet restaurants that only serve 
vegan dishes. So for me um, to take this journey with the rest of the team, it was just, it was, it was really special. I mean, if the life cycle does what it's supposed to do, we all lose our parents at some point, but to have such a tremendous amount of projects, quality projects to really kind of sink your hands into, it has been the most therapeutic thing that a loving child could ever ask for. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of many, we're not done. There's other works ahead of us, but um, I learned so much, the tapes that they referenced, um, my dad had 16 books, so 16 books and 12 albums. My dad passed at the age of 84, which if you do the math, that, that's about 60 years of this man talking into a microphone or a camera. I assure you, there's more lock boxes somewhere with Dick Gregory telling sure. and what, what jo the, the joy and quite honestly, the comfort I get in my dad's voice being the dominant voice of this documentary. <clears throat> Dick Gregory's like a, a father figure to so many people. Um, it, at my dad's funeral, 10,000 people were there. 3,000 insisted they sit in the front row because they were the man's best friend. And I'd never heard of any of them in the last 20 years. So it speaks to just his activity. But in that time period, um, so many folks are so passionate about the man, they think they know everything. So for me to tell something different than what they heard, there would be pushback. There'll be no pushback here because it's the man in his own voice. And if you live to be 84 years, you have the right to change your mind and tweak opinions. And so you see the beauty of the life cycle throughout this documentary. And even if someone didn't know Dick Gregory at all, just seeing the beauty of the growth and development, the struggle, this documentary, as you all have seen, just really captures that. So um, I continue to learn, you know, I'm a, I'm a pupil, I'm an apt pupil of Dick Gregory, so um, I can't get enough of it. So um, this was a true blessing and it continues to be. So there are lockboxes out there. You heard it. Listen, you can add me at Tremaine Lee at Twitter. You find me, make sure I get a first glimpse at it. Oh, yeah. People trust in recipient. The time. They reach out to us all the time. It's like, you know, emails. Oh, I got this. I got that. You know, it's amazing. Stuff. It's a lot. It's a lot. Buried in crawl spaces and basements and closets and Lord knows what. I mean, it was a it's a unique thing because, you know, Dick Gregory's um, uh, uh protege was, I mean, not protege, but the, the, you know, the man that really sort of advanced him uh, was Hugh Hefner. And Hugh Hefner had a videographer and a scribe that followed him around every day and kept, you know, a tightly organized catalog of his life of which he was going to donate to the Smithsonian upon his death, which he did. Dick Gregory never restricted anybody from filming him or interviewing him. Not and at all. So that meant there was, there's all this content all over the world that even we haven't uncovered. I mean, at this point, we have the largest archive, consolidated archive, but all over the world, there's all types of photos and videos and audio of Dick Gregory that at the end of the day is uh, something that we wanted to try to capture this type of film that we wanted to try to make. Andre, now that you 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 know you guys got your arms around uh, this enormous trove, right, uh, of his life documented, what do you think um, many people got wrong about Dick Gregory? Now that you've seen it all, what do you well, seen a lot of it? What do you think most people got wrong or get wrong? Uh, you know, he's a controversial figure because of a lot of the things that he said and a lot of the way that he delivered it. Uh, those things that he said, but. I think that what uh, that that sort of hard exterior in many cases uh, sort of uh, overwhelmed people's perception of about how lovable Dick Gregory was as a person. I mean, he hazed us. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> he whipped us with his tongue when we first met him. He, it's like I have to sit here and talk to all you cute people. He called us. You know, he he really let us have it. But we realized that kind of very quickly that that was like the rite of passage with this man because he had seen and done and experienced literally like everything someone could in a single life. I mean, more than someone could in a single life. But he would always embrace you. He would, you know, hug you. He'd come up right to you and say, how are you doing? How's your family? Talk to you like he knew you. Like he knew who your family was, knew who your relatives were, your parents, just the relationships that you had. 
and you felt that and you really felt that and like it's a gift it's really a gift that few people have uh, you know there's some politicians we talk about that have that type of gift there's actors that we talk about there's activists that we talk about that have that warmth that you can feel when somebody actually walks into the room and um he talks about this as being a turtle you know hard on the outside soft on the inside and willing to stick your neck out like that is a perfect personification of who dick gregory mm -hmm. you know was and is i mean he's just as present to us today as he he was yeah. when he was walking the earth you know his spirit is just that powerful and so i think that that's what we wanted to try to convey in this story that's what we wanted to try to bring out uh when it came to 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 telling this story valerie with hey. everything that andre just said i wanted to ask you how do you think uh this documentary recenters or refocuses the narrative of, of dick gregory's life yeah well this was definitely an attempt to um to take control of that narrative there's a lot of falsehoods out there surrounding the black experience and and our icons and dick gregory himself and um, I feel like this doc does a great job of showing the duality of Dick Gregory, which is really important. Um, you know, his history as an outsider, um, that's what I believe gave him so much, uh, you know, great empathy and fearlessness and confidence. Everyone talks about, you know, how he approaches things in this fearless nature, where I think it is because of that you know, being an outsider, because if you think about it, um, a little bit of bankruptcy, a little bit of cancer, a little bit of uh, danger cannot compare to uh, surviving childhood, surviving a childhood while being black and poor, you know? And I think that we do a great job of showing how those wounds, those, uh, disadvantages um, were turned into, you know, the superpowers. That was really important to us to, to show both of that. So, yeah. You know, one thing that, that was interesting to me among many things in the film, uh, Christian, is his friendships with um, Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers and Muhammad Ali and Harry Belafonte. And, and I'm drawn to, you know, in recent years in the wake of uh, Mike Brown and Ferguson and other uh, moments like that where we saw this kind of convulsing dick gregory was befriending some of the younger activists right and i know he meant a lot to this new generation and i wonder for you um what it means to have that torch pass folks who are entertainers and activists but also again focused on uplifting black people and empowering black people in a great question in i mean Loving and lovable wasn't just a mantra for my dad. It was a way of life. I mean, it's a, he truly, he truly, lo I, I watched him attend. So my dad was a, you know, a, a, a diehard anti-capital punishment. And I watched him go to just as many white folks who were being um, put to death in protest out in front, many of them who had done heinous things to black people. I mean, he just really felt the right to life um, you know, shouldn't just be focused on, you know, nine months of conception, it should be focused throughout the life cycle. So he was an advocate. I mean, we think about civil rights, but um, the civil rights movement really advanced women's rights, it, it, it advanced disabled American rights. And so there were so many beneficiaries. And, and I'm saying this, and I'm smiling, because as I speak about these things, I think about my dad's jokes that he used in his material that he would Everything was about laughter. It was never about making fun of something. It was about pointing out the failures, uh, failure to think and failure to analyze and failure to respect the earth and our fellow human beings. And he just had an ability to really bring focus to that. So he always said, I mean, his audience, most of his audience was young folks. When he left the, the, the big circuit of comedy, because he was no longer wanted to be in venues that served alcohol or that people were smoking cigarettes. All he did was speak at not just black colleges, but white colleges all over the country. So when we were at Coretta Scott King's funeral down in um, just outside of Atlanta, all living presidents were there and George W. Bush was sitting president then and he broke away from his secret service detail to hug my dad and say, you gave the commencement address when I graduated from Yale. So he just was, he was just in perpetual motion. Um, and so 
older folks and he loved, I mean, so the, you know, younger folks that know, you know, this fire breathing, fired up man that they see silver bearded on the internet would say, wait, this man spoke and gave commencement addresses. And so for me as a child, it was so difficult when people would say, hey, what does your dad do? Now I can just point them to this documentary and say, watch the documentary. And then like we're doing here, we'll have a QA and a after. And it makes my job profoundly easier. And I understand not everyone can have this. So um, I feel selfish and uh, very appreciative. So, um, but it feels good to see, to have seen him for his lifetime embrace youth. He understood that he, I mean, part of the reason he had 10 children, that was his answer to genocide. So he was always about youth, the people, respecting the marginalized. And so it's, um, and he was always, I couldn't keep up with them. I mean, he was a man on the streets. I would call myself keeping tabs on him and I would go to bed at 3 a.m. up just watching him. I'd wake up at five and he was already out in the streets. And so mm. the universe protected the man and um, folks will learn a ton, but he loved young folks. He was always advocating. He was saying, stop telling young folks, put their pants up. Not that he was pro that. He said, we got bigger, we got bigger issues to address. We get focused on laser focused on the things that are not going to yield the biggest results. So, um, so I love that young folks, I manage my dad's social media. There's a massive following that just can't get enough Dick Gregory. And so many of them are going to enjoy seeing the the formative years of Dick Gregory to see many of them come from very similar. I mean, you know, us Gregory children, we almost choked. We had so many silver spoons in our mouth, but to see what my dad endured and it really is a lesson of survival, tenacity, respect, but most importantly, love. I think we have time for one more question. I, I do want to ask this, you know, obviously art is in the eye of the beholder, but I wonder what each of you hope the audience took away from this. They've just seen it or they will see it. You know, what do you hope they take away from it? Let's start with you, uh, Valerie. Um, I think there's this misconception that Dick Gregory gave up comedy, um, that he left comedy. And I really hope that the audience is able to understand uh, that Dick Gregory just refused to stay in his own lane. You know, society is always telling entertainers to stay in their own lane. In fact, I would say he used comedy to, to cut his teeth, so to speak. Uh, had he not been successful in comedy, would he have been you know, as influential as he was? I don't know, but I definitely feel like you know, comedy prepared him for his role in civil rights. And he you know, definitely kept it in his arsenal, weaponized comedy, and most importantly used it to uh, inspire people to you know, be better and to fight. And I think that Dick Gregory actually made the struggle bearable using mm -hmm. comedy. And people don't talk enough about that. They don't talk about what it takes to survive and continue fighting. And he was that light, that breath of fresh air. Andre? I, I think really the same thing uh, that Val was describing. I, I think I want people to come away inspired, really, the same way that, that I was inspired uh, by the man's life. Uh, we made this movie, but the influence he's had overall on my life personally is substantial. I mean, I you know put my family on Dick Gregory's Christmas fast. My, parents and, and uh, brother and his wife and kids and everybody, they, you know, damn near killed me at the end of it, but they were, <laughs> they were thanking me, uh, you know, for, for doing it just to kind of uh, create a, a breath of fresh air for themselves and an, an enlightenment uh, at the end of a process of really depriving yourself of things so that you can think more clearly about what really matters. And that's just one, you know, example. And it's like, you look at somebody like Dick Gregory and it's like, what am I doing? You know, I mean, here's a man who, who lived nine full lives and we would just be lucky to, to live one of those, any of us as, as individuals. And that's really, I think, what I want people to take away from it is, to, is really to be inspired to do more, that you as an individual can really be a, 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 a force of, of nature. And Dick Gregory would always say to me that he, he doesn't do what you think he should do. He's not a politician. He's not 
the Pope. He's not a prime minister. He's not president of the United States. He, he, he did what the universal God inspired him to do. That was something that he always said. And I think that by doing that, he created uh, himself uh, and, and became a conduit to be that inspiration for so many millions of people. And to be able to tell that story and honor him while still telling the trials and tribulations that he experienced is something I think is uh, really been the great honor of my life. And I think uh, the goal is to try to have people inspired by it at the end of the day. And Christian, the last word goes to you on this. What do you hope folks take away from? I rarely, as a man of many words, I rarely repeat what someone else has said, but I agree with Val and, and uh, Andre um, to do more. I mean, uh, some of us have the audacity with all of the abundance, that strong Wi-Fi, HVAC, just super comfortable to come home and be tired and feel like we can't do more for humanity. Um, I, I'm not hoping, I'm certain this documentary is going to motivate folks to do more. Look out for your fellow human beings. Look out for each other. We just went through this pandemic. We see all of the, you know, we all we see all of the discrepancies and we want to talk about it. And you know, after George Floyd, folks call, well, let's talk about it. We're just on the hundredth anniversary of Tulsa. Let's talk about it. We don't need a collective group thing. Just you as an individual stop and do do more. And that's a, that's what I hope to take away. I'm certain and confident, um, you know, Pops is gone, but he's still pulling the strings here. He really was the true executive producer here, not me. So um, I'm certain that folks are going to receive this. And I don't know how they could not be inspired to do more and whatever that means to them to do more to make the world a better place. I'm, I'm wearing my turtle shell green here today, sticking my neck out. So making props happy. So to all of us to do more. The one and only Dick Gregory, a remarkable documentary. Thank you all for bringing it to us. I greatly appreciate it. And I know so many other people will. Uh, Valerie, Christian, Andre, uh, AFI Docs, thank you so much for uh, for thank being here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much thank for having you. me. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. And on Absolutely. behalf of AFI, thank you, Tremaine. And thanks, everybody. This has been a truly inspiring conversation about an inspiring man and an inspiring film. Thank you so much. We just wanna urge our audience to uh, please go ahead and tell all your friends that the film is available to screen to the end of the festival. We'd love to hear from you on social media, hashtag AFI Docs. And please do discover our full lineup and virtual events at docs.afi.com. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.